it is now. Good. Since I don't have a pulpit to stand behind this morning, I might be wandering around a little bit more today. But anyway, I want us to begin this morning, I want to ask the question right up front. Why is it that the church exists? And I'm sure already many of you already have many different answers or answers popping up in your mind. But when I'm speaking about the church this morning, I'm specifically speaking about why is it that we offer the programs or the ministries that we offer here at this church? Or why is it that any church offers the programs and the ministries that it does? I mean, why are we doing Vacation Bible School this week? Why do we have a lot on Wednesday evenings? Why do we have Sunday school? Why do we meet at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings and have a worship service and 6 o'clock on Sunday nights and have a worship time and prayer meeting on Wednesday? Why do we do all of this stuff? Why is it that people even go to church? You know, I believe that there are many, even in the church itself, that still have a misconception or even a wrong idea of why the church exists and what the church is all about. It's about uh, kind of like a, a Methodist preacher who's been trying to get a man to come to his church for, for a while now. And finally, when he went to the man and he asked him, he says, why is it you won't come to church? And the man said, it's just simply because I don't have any decent clothes to wear. Well, the man got, the pastor got one of his congregation members to take him out, take this man out, take him in and, and get him a nice suit and a tie and shirt and pants and, and nice shoes and all of that to get him fixed up so he would feel more comfortable coming to church. Well, the next Sunday came around, the man still didn't come to church. Well, the pastor went and visited him and says, you know, we got you all these nice clothes. Why, why did you not make it to church this past Sunday? And the man said, well, when he got up and he put on all those nice clothes and he saw himself in the mirror, he said, you know what? He said, I look so nice, I decided to go to the Episcopal church this morning. <laughs> As if... There was some direct correlation between how a person dresses and what church they go to. You know, this morning, I think first thing we need to do is just remind ourselves and understand what is the church. And I went to Webster's and looked at their definition. And really, I was kind of curious, you know, being a secular body entity, just to see how they define the church. And really, they sort of kind of gave two definitions. And the first definition was this. It's a building for public and especially Christian worship. So in that definition, they talk about the church being an actual physical building. And then the other one, and they put in brackets there, they say often capitalized, which, of course, I'm sure they're meaning when it's capitalized with a capital C. Here's that definition. A body or an organization of religious believers such as the whole body of Christians. So in one respect, they're talking about the church being a building, and in another respect, Webster's defines the church as a body of people, a group of people that meet together, and specifically, the actual definition says, as in a whole body of Christians. But let's look at how the Bible describes the church. I want to look at a couple passages here. First one is from the Acts the eighth chapter in the first verse. And it says this. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all the all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So it talks about in this passage a persecution breaking out against the church. Well if the church was a church building, why in the world would people be persecuting a building? Okay. What did they got against that building being there? Okay. So right there we know off the bat in Scripture when it's talking about this, it's talking about the church being people, a group of people, a body of believers. Another passage, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, it says this, And God placed all things under His, Christ's feet, and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Well, again, I ask, based on this passage, if the church was a building, why in the word, world would a building be referred 
church as the body of Christ. Why in the world would this passage speak of the church that holds the fullness of Christ? Why would it refer to a building being the fullness of Christ himself? Well, again, it's just obvious that it's talking about the people. And because the church is the fullness of Christ, it's referring to the spirit that lives inside of each and every believer, the Holy Spirit that lives in us that makes up the church. Again, a body of people, a group of people, believers. And in this last passage, Ephesians 5, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, we've already mentioned the church being referred to as the body of Christ. A group of people instead of just a building being the body of Christ but here specifically says of which he is the savior of the church again if the church was a building why would Christ need to come to earth to save a building so again we see in the biblical definition and really the second definition of Webster this morning as we're talking about the church and why we do what we do as the church that we are talking about us each and every one of us in here. Each and every one of us individually. Myself certainly included. So now that we understand what the church is, why is it that we do what we do as the church, as the body of Christ, the full representation of Him here on this earth? Well, I want to give you three reasons, three answers as to why we do that. Why Vacation Bible School? Why Awana? Why Sunday School? Why all of these programs? Why all of these different ministries? If you'll turn over to the second chapter of Acts, this is a passage I want to look at just for a moment. And I am going to be kind of short this morning because uh, normally the second Sunday of the month, this is our normal time for our church business meeting. And since we're not having church tonight because of Bible school, we're going to have a quick business meeting immediately following our service. So I will make sure we have enough time for that. But anyway, look at the second chapter of Acts, beginning in verse 36. Now this is right after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon those first early believers, those early followers of Jesus Christ. And after this happened, Peter... Of course, the disciple of Christ, that disciple that Jesus told and said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter breaks out preaching a message, preaching a sermon. And this is toward the eater end of Peter's message, where he says in verse 36, he says, Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So here's the first reason why we do what we do, the first answer to that. And it's just very simply found in that very first verse we read is that Jesus is Lord and Christ. Well, you might ask, okay, well, what does that mean? What does that have to do with why we do what we do as the church body? Well, first of all, that word Lord, and you know, a lot of times it sort of surprises me when I'm speaking to people about salvation and I talk to them and I try to be careful, you know, not use a lot of religious terms and religious jargon because for many believers, many of them haven't been exposed to church or haven't even been in a church and they may not understand all this religious talk. And so when I say to them about accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I ask them, I said, what does that word Lord mean? And I get a blank stare. But here's what that word Lord means. It just simply means master. And Jesus is Lord of your life. He is your master. He is the one who rules your life. He is the one that you look to each and every day daily for guidance and for leadership and for direction and for wisdom. Because He is your Master. He is your Lord. 
But it says here, Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Christ. So what does that word Christ mean? Well, Christ is just simply the, the Greek English term for Messiah that we see in the Old Testament. It just simply means anointed. It means that Jesus Christ was the chosen, sent Son of God to this earth to be the Savior of the world. And so the first reason why we do what we do as the body, as the church, is because Jesus is Lord. He is our master, or at least I hope he is, not only of this church body, but of each and every one of us individually and of our lives. And he is Christ. He is God's chosen son of God. And so therefore, it's just as like Peter explained in Matthew 16, 16, where Jesus asked him and he looks at Peter and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter cried out, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And as his church, we are to do the work that our master commands us to do. And that is, above everything else, to proclaim daily, just as Peter did, that Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. Now give you another little illustration, personal illustration. Our, our little grandson, Carter, is three years old. And when Carter and Mallory stay with us, Carter and I, at times, will get into this exchange back and forth. Carter has gotten to where, I don't know, a while back, Carter and Mallory came over and they were wanting a snack. And so I, Carter's very picky when it comes to food. So I decided, well, I'll see if he likes oatmeal cream pies. Well, the boy loves oatmeal cream pies. He calls them meal cookies. And so now, whenever he walks in the door, his first words out of his mouth is, I want a meal cookie. And, and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, two hours before supper time or 15 minutes before supper time. You know what a good granddad is going to do, right? He's going to give that child a meal cookie. Okay? Now, I may not be that bad, Lord, so no, you are that bad, okay? So I'm going to give that child a meal cookie, okay? And when he gets done or if he's, you know, eating a bag of chips or whatever, then we get into this exchange. And when he gets done, I'll say, Carter, go throw your trash away. And he'll look at me and he's got this sort of little grin on his face. Like, you know, he'll look at me and he said, no, you do it. I said, no, it's your trash. You go throw it away. And he said, no, you do it. I said, no, you go throw it. He said, no, you. And we'll have this exchange back and forth for a minute or two, right? And then I have to basically make a game out of it. And I said, you better hurry and get into the trash and run, 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 hurry. So he'll take off running and go throw his trash away. Because it's become a game to him, right? Here's the point I want to make with that. In the church, there are too many people that think somebody else needs to do it when it comes to the work of the church. Psalm 96 says this. Sing to the Lord a new song. And when it's talking about a new song, it's talking about praise coming from our mouth, coming from our lips, because of the change that Jesus has made in our heart and in our life. Because we are new creations, and so therefore we're going to sing a new song of praise to the Lord. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise His name, proclaim His salvation day after day. And it doesn't continue there, but I'm tempted to say day after day after day after day after day, as long as we're here on this earth. And then it says, declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. It's because Jesus is Christ and Lord is why we do what we do as the church, as the body of Christ. Here's the second reason why. It's because people are lost and searching. If you look at verse 37, after Peter says to them, God has made this Jesus whom he crucified both Lord and Christ, and it says the people were cut to their hearts, and then they asked Peter, they said, well, brothers, what shall we do? we got a lot of people out there right here in Mount Vernon today. We've got a lot of people in the state of Georgia. We've got a lot of people everywhere asking, what do I need to do in order to have eternal life? What do I need to do in order to be right with God so that I can know with complete confidence and assurance that when my time on this earth is over, I'm going to be in heaven? There's a lot of people asking, what do we do? And there are a lot of people searching, trying to find out what they need to do. I know many of you have probably heard of Charles Spurgeon. Probably, at least in my opinion, probably one of the best preachers ever of all time. 
I don't know how many of you have actually heard Charles Spurgeon's testimony of how he came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And if you'll just bear with me, I want to read to you uh, his own words of his testimony, how he came to be saved. He says this, I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair until now had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning while I was going to a certain place of worship. I turned down a side street and I came to a little primitive Methodist church. And in that chapel there may have been a dozen or 15 people. He said, I've heard of the primitive Methodists, how they sang so loudly that they made people's heads ache. But that did not matter to me. I wanted to know how I might be saved. Well, the minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. At last, a very thin-looking man, who was a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, he went up to the pulpit to preach. Now, it is well that preachers be instructed, but this man was really stupid. I mean, this is Charles Spurgeon's own words, right? He was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. And his text was this, from Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Spurgeon goes on to say he did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimmer of hope for me in that text. And then he said this tailor, the shoemaker, began to say this. This is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now look and don't take a deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It is just look. Well, a man needn't go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man needn't be worth a thousand a year to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. But then the text says, look unto me. A, he said in his broad Essex dialect, he said, many on ye are looking to yourselves, but it's no use looking there. You'll never find any comfort in yourselves. Some say, look to God the Father. No, look to Him by and by. But Jesus Christ says, look unto me. Some on ye say, we must wait for the Spirit's working. You have no business with that just now. Look to Christ. The text says, look unto me. And then the good man followed up his text in this way. Look unto me. I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I am hanging on the cross. Look unto me, I am dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend to heaven. Look unto me, I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner, look unto me, look unto me. And when he had managed to spin out about ten minutes or so, he was at the end of his tether, and then he looked at me under the gallery, and I dare say with so few present, he knew me to be a stranger. And just fixing his eyes on me as if he knew all my heart, he said, Young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did. But I had not been accustomed to have remarks made from the pulpit on my personal appearance before. However, it was a good blow. Struck right home. And he continued, And you will always be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment you will be saved. And this lifting of his hands, he shouted as only a primitive Methodist could do. Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. And Charles Spurgeon said, I saw at once the way of salvation. You know, you never know. When somebody might walk through these doors of the church who is lost and who is searching for some meaning and some purpose for living and they need their eyes open so that they can look and they can see that the way to salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. Many of those will be walking through these doors this week. So the reason why we do what we do is because Jesus is Lord. He is our master. He is Christ. He is the chosen one sent by God. And also because people are lost and people are searching. But here's the last reason. It's because it is an investment in people's eternity. If you look at verse 41, we're told here that those who accepted the message of Peter, they were baptized. 
and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Do you realize that before this, there were only about 120 followers? And in one day, 3,000 were added. Do you realize that's a 2,500% increase in that church that one day? Ooh. I think if that happened here, some of us would run. A 2,500% increase. You know, the fact is, whatever ministry, whatever program we offer here is because we are investing in the lives of people. We are investing in their eternity and investment in the kingdom of Jesus Christ himself. You know, I can invest myself. I can invest my time. I can invest my financial resources in my family. I can invest myself, my time, my financial resources in my work. I can invest myself and my time and my financial resources in this church even. But none of that has any significance for eternity like making that investment in the salvation of people's souls. That's why we do what we do. And if we do what we do for any other reason, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. So why are we doing BBS this week? Or why is it we're doing anything else that we do? Because it's an investment in the eternity of children and of youth and of adults. And there should be no other reason. Would you bow your head with me?